Well, first of all, I would like to thank you all very much for being here uh, in the room and online for the defense of my PhD thesis titled Reconstructing the Topography and Water Level of the Mediterranean Sea During the Mycenaean Salinity Crisis. And this work was undertaken here at the Geosciences Barcelona Institute and the University of Barcelona. And it was supervised by Daniel Garcia Castellanos and Yvonne Jiménez Mont. Now, first, a very brief note on the context of my thesis. Uh, it was undertaken in uh, the Salt Giant European Training Network, which is funded by the European Commission. And this uh, training network consisted of 15 PhD projects hosted at different institutions all around Europe and in partner countries. And my thesis is part of Work Package 1, which was focused on the formation of the Mediterranean salt giants, mostly from a geoscience perspective. And over the next 45 minutes, uh, you will see the presentation of results that were uh, coming from collaborations with different people in this project. So uh, very briefly, how I will structure this presentation, we will start by introducing the main open questions around the Mycenaean salinity crisis and the Mediterranean salt giants. Then we'll move on to uh, how I no, 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 where uh, we start in the Albadan Basin, then we move eastwards towards the rest of the Western Mediterranean, and finally we take a look at the Nile Delta region. And from there, I would like to try in the discussion to uh, synthesize a general model for the Mycenaean salinity crisis based on the results that we observe in the different regions. And finally, we'll take a very brief uh, look at the conclusions of my thesis and the forward perspective for interesting future lines of research. So, so the Mediterranean salt giant is a huge suit of evaporite deposits that cover most of the Mediterranean basin, where uh, uh, it is an estimated to contain one million cubic kilometers of salt, and, and that represents upwards of five percent of the global ocean salt volume. And all these deposits were uh, deposited during a period known as the Mycenaean salinity crisis, which took place between 5.97 and 5.33 million years ago. And, and it's and it is actually giving us a very good So very briefly, evaporites are formed when um, ions in a solution in marine water reach their saturation point. And then we have evaporitic rocks that are deposited, usually in order of increasing solubility in seawater. So we start with carbonates, then we move to the less soluble uh, gypsum and hydrides, then the halides, which is the main component of normal uh, seawater, and finally the lesser salts. And the evaporation of one kilometer of normal seawater would result in a, a layer of about 17 meters of evaporites dominated by halides. So, so then we can ask ourselves, how is it possible that we find such a large evaporite deposit inside the Mediterranean Sea, which is just a normal marine basin nowadays? And, and a very important clue we can see in its current configuration, where the Mediterranean is essentially a very large evaporated lake, where uh, there is less freshwater supplied by rain and river runoff than is evaporated over the basin. So if we didn't have the connection to the uh, global ocean at Gibraltar, which is very narrow and shallow, the water level in the Mediterranean would be dropping by around one meter per year through evaporation. But we have Atlantic water flowing in at the Gibraltar Strait um, to uh, maintain the water budget in the Mediterranean. But of course, this brings in salts that, if there was no system to export them, would start accumulating in the Mediterranean basin and raise the salinity very rapidly. And this is prevented by a complex system of ocean currents where dense and more saline uh, bottom waters are formed. And export again at the Gibraltar through an outflow, which is more saline and therefore maintains the salt budget in the Mediterranean. And uh, the, the Sicily Straits uh, is also very important here, as this topographic high kind of uh, modulates the exchange between the different sub basins. And we can imagine that during a stage of uh, hydrological crisis, Sicily still would probably um, be important in modulating the uh, the way that the western and the eastern basins. Go. 
So what we know is that if we block the outflow or the inflow at the Gibraltar Strait, the Mediterranean basin would be in a hydrological crisis. And the evidence for the Brazilian salinity crisis that has already uh, been described many, many decades ago, uh, well over 50 years, where we have, for example, evaporite deposits like these gypsum deposits in the south of Spain, or halides that is still being mined in Sicily. Uh, and this is found in the Unter basins, but also from seismic reflection studies, we know that uh, we have a large presence of evaporites in the Mediterranean subsurface in the deep basin. And already since the first drilling campaign in the 70s, we know that we performed more or less simultaneously in a deep Mediterranean sea. And another kind of evidence for a salinity crisis actually lies in the erosion of river canyons, where um, in order to erode a river below its normal base level and global sea level, you would require to lower the water level in the Mediterranean Sea. And a very famous example is the Nile Canyon incision that has been proposed to have taken place all the way up to the Aswan Dam, based on these four holes uh, that were done during the construction of the dam there. And this is 1,000 kilometers upstream of the current coastline. And here it was proposed that we had a Sunni incision and then a uh, marine incursion where uh, marine fossils would have been identified in the flying uh, sediments here. And similarly, we see river incision in the Rhone Valley Canyon from site of reflection data and well data. We have a few uh, more examples from more uh, illustrative uh, 3D seismic data, for example, here in the Po uh, or in the Ebro River in the South of Spain. And where we see also the fluvial network in the reflexivity uh, images. And an example from the Fall River in North Italy, where similarly we see a clear Mycenaean erosion surface in the uh, base of the Bayern. So many decades of chromostratographic uh, correlation between the different basins have led to the um, synthesis of a consensus model, where the Mycenaean salinity crisis is divided, divided into three separate stages. And this is mostly based on dating of the onshore deposits, where the alternations between evaporite deposits and mastodons are interpreted as uh, forced by procession cycle uh, uh, cycling, climate cycles. And then each cycle would present, represent about 20,000 years. So in this way, the, we have the dating of the stage one, which would have lasted around 370,000 years, and during which we have the deposition of the primary lower gypsum on the shore, and uh, lower evaporites in the deeper basin, although these have not been really sampled directly. And then we have stage two, which onshore is represented by a 50,000 year stratigraphic gap. And this is where the deposition is in the deep basin, place of two massive evaporite deposits, and as well as when a water level drop is beginning to have been taking place along the formation of the road. And, and so the primary lower gypsum in this stage is a brief on the but there are two very, very big problems uh, mainly concerning the timing and the magnitude of the problem. So, so some believe that the water level never dropped more than 200 years, while others estimate that the water level went down by over a kilometer. And, and also the timing of the uh, evaporate deposition and the drawdown is the same. Some place the evaporate deposition before, some don't. during, and some after the drawdown. So, uh, and then we have stage three, which lasted about 220,000 years, during which we have the deposition of the upper evaporites, which are again dominated by gypsum, so with lower salinity than the halide domain. And, and also, what we see in this stage is the deposition of Lagomara deposits, which has a brackish uh, geographical signal, and it contains also fossils derived from the Palatine Basin, which was located to the east of the Mediterranean, on the large inland lake. And the more dominant uh, presence of these brackish water deposits suggests that during this stage, uh, the, imp or the impact of the fresh water into the Mediterranean was more important. But, but this is already a very different so how we have low sensitivity deposits with an evaporate uh, basin. And then also, uh, the question is to how uh, uh, the water level would have risen enough to explain the magmatic deposits that were found in there. So, so what was the history already connected? Or did we have a isolated case? And then, then what do you think? So, so some of these questions, questions will not be answered by any because they are very broad. But um, what my thesis is aimed to is to illustrate some of these problems and to uh, resolve them through a better understanding of Mycenaean paleogeography.
For example, you're not aware of the exact gateway position between the Atlantic and the Mediterranean during the Mycenaean. We don't really know exactly what was the depth and the connectivity of different sub-bases that we where we find the deposit. And we are not really aware of the original depth information on the original markers that we have. Because the Mycenaean markers have been affected by vertical motion since the Mycenaean right up to the accommodation sediments. So, of course, previous work has been undertaken trying to reach the point markers, their original depth. What we see, see is that most of these studies have very inconsistent results, where some, some find very major drawdowns from uh, restoration of the shorelines, and uh, what we see is that we don't have a lot of consistency is, is that most of these studies are based on small parts or, or on the restoration. The discussion if you restore the which we see in So the objectives of work can be properly categorized as two main objectives. The first related to the Mediterranean water level during the stages of the Mycenaean. This will be achieved by restoring the original depth of the erosion features and then comparing the objective view. And then secondly, we will look at the original depth distribution identified by deposits. And see, and see what the implications would be for the timing and the mechanism of evaporation. So, so we, we identify target regions for this kind of work. There are a few very important requirements that must be met. And, and first, first that they need a very good coverage of uh, reflection seismic and well data in order to train the depth and thicknesses of all the Mycenaean markers that we uh, like to restore. And secondly, uh, uh, we have either a limited or a very well constrained subtropic depth in order to identify properly a paleo shoreline marker and this is an assumption that we have to make so like to illustrate here. So the there are three major vertical motions that we try to restore, and the first is related to the flexural isostatic response of the lithosphere when it is loaded at the surface. And this is done using a numerical model called DISC, and it's based on the principle that when you load the lithosphere with a surface load being either evaporites, sediments, or uh, fluctuations in the water level, then the lithosphere will sink into the viscous asthenosphere in order to um, re-establish a hydrostatic equilibrium at a certain depth. And the amount of subsidence that is caused here is then dependent on the contrast between the densities of the mantle, the load, and the environment. And in addition, we have flexure, which uh, describes, because the lithosphere is not just going to have a completely local compensation, but rather it has a certain strength, and therefore it's able to laterally transfer the load stresses and cause bending of the lithosphere where the wavelength of this bending is controlled by the effective elastic thickness of the lithosphere. And this is dependent on the rheological properties. Then the second source of vertical motions that we restore is the thermal subsidence, where um, after an initial thinning of the lithosphere, we have a, uh, a, a more steep geotherm. And gradually over time, this geotherm will reestablish itself by cooling at the base of the lithosphere and thermal contraction will cause an isostatic subsidence component there, which is dependent both on the amount of initial stretching and also on the time that has elapsed since the uh, extension phase. And finally, uh, one other source of subsidence that we try to restore is the compaction of the sediments that are found underneath the Mycenaean sequence. So, so when, when we start, we when a sediment is formed at the surface, it has a relatively high porosity. And then, and then when it gets, it gets buried at depth, depth the pore, pore space reduces and you lose the volume of the sediments. And, and this, this subs subsidence is then dependent on the lithology because the uh, initial porosity and the rate at which it decreases is strongly dependent on the, uh, on the, the composition of the sediments. So, so looking at our restoration, we start with their interpreted seismic data. And we convert this to depth in meters using either a constant velocity or a velocity uh, profile. And separately, we try to, uh, from the description of the lithospheric uh, states, to know what time and magnitude of extension we would have had, and therefore what the possible thermal subsidence component would have been.
So when we have depth of other horizons, we can constrain the magnitude of each component of vertical motion and yes. subtract all of these from the current depth of the base Pliocene surface, resulting in our Mycenaean topography at a normal water level. And from there, we can calculate also the flexural response that we would have if we unload all the water from the basin. And this results in a Mycenaean topography during, a Mycenaean, uh, during the, the low stand stage. So here we see kind of the, the lateral distribution of these different components of vertical motions from a schematic profile of the Mycenaean stratigraphy in the Western Mediterranean. And if we can identify a paleo shoreline marker in the, um, in the seismic stratigraphy, and then we know the distribution of each vertical motion uh, component. We can step by step reconstruct our shoreline marker and match the water level in order to uh, be at the right level for to form the shoreline marker. And here we see an example of the uh, plan form distribution of the vertical motions responding to uh, surface load. So of course, this approach has a number of uh, limitations and assumptions that we have to make where important ones are related to the properties of the lithosphere. For example, the effective elastic thickness, the age and magnitude of extension and the thermal properties, and also uh, the lithological properties of the sediments and the evaporite layers themselves. So for example, sometimes we don't have an exact constraint on their seismic velocity, their density and their porosity parameters that are all important in our restoration. And also, of course, we are making a basic assumption that we are able to interpret a feature in the seismic stratigraphy as a paleo shoreline marker and to uh, identify it as either subaqueous or subaerial. So in order to deal with these uncertainties, we test in our numerical model for a wide range of parameters, but the uncertainty in the Mycenaean topography is still on the order of hundreds of meters. So now we'll move on to the results of my work, starting in the Albadan Basin here in the western part of the Mediterranean. And this work has been submitted for uh, publication and was undertaken in collaboration with Fadan Estrada and Gemma Ercia at the uh, Marine Science Institute here in Barcelona, among others. And the Albadan Basin is very, very important because this is the location where we have the connection to the global ocean. And um, actually in this basin, we don't find any thick evaporite deposits, but rather we see that it's dominated by um, erosion on the Mycenaean surface, where we have a very major erosional channel running from the Gibraltar Strait all the way to the um, edge of the deep basin here that reaches up to 600 meters depth of incision, and that has been linked to the reflooding of the Mediterranean at the end of the Mycenaean. And in addition, we see uh, some stepped features in the uh, Mycenaean topography, which are several kilometers wide and tens of kilometers long. And these have been interpreted as shoreline terraces that would have formed during a relatively stable water level uh, during the reflooding. So here we see the example of the data on which these interpretations is based. Here we see a very clear, uh, unconformity between the pre-Mycenaean sediments and the Pliocene film on top, close to the Strait of Gibraltar. And this channel is about 20 kilometers wide and reaches hundreds of meters deep. And in addition, here we have the geometry of the Mycenaean surface, uh, where we see these stepped features that are uh, interpreted as shoreline terraces. So um, in the Albadan Basin, we have a small complication on our uh, topographic reconstruction due to the geodynamic setting, where the yeah. basin has been possibly undergoing yeah. quite significant vertical motions due to presence of a subducting lithospheric slab, which is imaged from seismic tomography here in the western part of the Albadan Basin, and which is thought to have been de or slowly uh, rupturing from east to west, where it's currently still attached from this point on, on the western, below uh, more or less the Gibraltar uh, region. And this has a twofold topographic effect where the, the tearing here along this edge would have caused a dynamic topography uplift since the Mycenaean uh, that's recorded in the Betics. And also in this region, it has been proposed to have been a source of subsidence as the weight of the slab present here would drag down the Gibraltar area. But the timing and the magnitude of this motion is not very well constrained. And in addition, we have the presence of the East Albadan volcanic arc, which, well, here is a pure magnetic crust, and this is the proposed extent of uh, volcanic uh, features. And um, because this is relatively young magmatic crust, possibly it underwent a very significant amount of thermal subsidence since the Mycenaean. And therefore it has been proposed as a possible position of the uh, Atlantic Mediterranean gateway, as opposed to, to the Gibraltar tectonic arc. So this has been proposed as a, a topographically exposed area. And this is something that we can um, try to test with our uh, restorations. So when we look at the depth of our reconstructed topography here, 
where we adjust for the flexure due to sediments and water level drop, the compaction of the underlying sediments, the thermal subsidence, where we test for a very wide range due to the presence of the volcanic arc. And uh, we also correct for tectonic uplift on the Albodon Ridge here. We see that actually in our restored topography, most of the Albodon Basin is still over one kilometer deep, um, but it would have been completely exposed by a 1.5 kilometer drawdown. And um, what we see is that this is a, a, a reference model. So this is not exactly the shallowest topography, but uh, what we see here is that parts of the volcanic region would have been exposed. And this is already counting the uplift from a water level drop. So this is a relatively shallow restoration. And what we see is that we still have pretty significant depth uh, marine channels between the, these volcanic highs. And therefore, it seems unlikely that this would have been the hydrological barrier to Atlantic waters from our restoration, as most of the volcanic arc is mostly still below modern sea level. And in addition, we see that in the Gibraltar region, the isostatic response to a desiccation would have provoked um, an uplift in the order of about 100 meters that would have been quite rapid. So if you have a disconnection here, possibly if you have a shallow connection and then you have a eustatic sea level drop, the response to the desiccation here would then make it very difficult to reconnect the Atlantic to the Mediterranean. So uh, when we look at the depth of the shoreline terraces that I mentioned before, we see here these uh, steps in the topograph in the uh, seismic stratigraphy. And although their current depth range is very wide, reaching up to 2000 meters, when we restore them to the uh, to the Mycenaean uh, times, either for a scenario where the basin is water filled or in a scenario where it is desiccated, we see that although the terrace depth become slightly more coherent, there is still a very wide depth range between them. And therefore, it is difficult to explain all of these terraces from a single stable water level. But rather, they suggest either that there was variability in the water level during their formation or that they are formed by separate processes, such as during the low stand and the reflooding stage. So we move on to the results in the Western Mediterranean, and this chapter has been published uh, about one year ago and was undertaken in collaboration with Fado Rat, a fellow salt giant student in Montpellier, and his supervisors Joanna Lofi and Agnès Maya. And in the Western Mediterranean, we have the very thick Mycenaean evaporite sequences, which allow us to identify actually two separate potential paleo shoreline markers. And these are related to the distribution of the, the halide units, which is here in yellow, and the upper unit, uh, gypsum or anhydrite, which is here distributed uh, or illustrated as the green area, and which extends further into the Valencia Basin. And something that we've also been able to do in this study is from our compilation of seismic reflection data, get a estimate of the volume of the halides and the upper unit in the Western Mediterranean. And actually this estimate was smaller by about 50% than previous ones, which partially also included the lower unit evaporites. So when we look at uh, our paleo shorelines, we identify them from two separate features in our seismic stratigraphy, where the first one is related to the onlap of the upper units, the gypsum, here onto the bottom erosion surface in the Valencia Basin, where the geometry of these onlaps has been suggested to be indicative of uh, formation in a relatively low uh, water. And therefore, the amount of onlap here indicates more or less a potential paleo shoreline, although there is still erosion also uh, on top. And, and this would have been a shoreline that would have been related to the stage three of the Mycenaean salinity crisis. Well, if we go further down, we identify a second potential shoreline marker at the pinch out of the mobile unit. Uh, this is believed to be more or less the transition from the bottom erosion surface to the preservation of halides. And because halides is easy, more easily preserved in a brine, this is identified as a potential shoreline marker for the initial drawdown, perhaps or at least probably related to stage two before the uh, upper unit was formed. So, so here again, we start from our modern stratigraphy and we go back step by step in time, restoring for the deposition of each uh, sediment and evaporite layer and the compaction in the basin. And what we see for the results of our paleo shoreline depth is that here we can test very clearly against different uh, water depth models. For example, uh, the suggestion that the water level never drops more than 200 meters or uh, that we have a drawdown of over uh, 1.5 kilometer. And what we see is that for our first shoreline marker of the upper unit in the Valencia Basin, our best fit paleo shoreline, which is shown here in red, is positioned when the water level is dropped by 1100 meters. So this is a very major drawdown in the Western Mediterranean required to expose the rest of the Valencia Basin.
And when we look at the limit of our halide units here, we have an even larger drawdown at 1500 meters. And um, so this would be the potentially the initial water level of the Medi Western Mediterranean after the desiccation. So what we see is actually two quite interesting things. The first is that you need a hundred hundreds of meters of water level change between the two stages in order to explain both of these as shorelines. And secondly, even when the water level drops 1500 meters, we would still preserve a pretty significant brine layer in the deep basin. So we would have a basically a very saline lake uh, in the deep Mediterranean during this stage. And another very interesting feature of the stratigraphy on the Balearic Promontory uh, of, or in the Western Mediterranean Basin are these isolated patches of halides that are unique examples of halides found at intermediate depth in the Mediterranean Basin. And what we see is that when we look at their current depth and we restore them to the, the depth of these basins before the halide would have deposited, we see that in here, the Cogedor Basin, all the way in the west, even though the halide thickness is not very thick and the, the depth would have been only slightly over 500 meters as this uh, deposit was formed. But for the Formentera Basin here, we similarly have a very relatively low halide thickness of west less than 100 meters, but the depth of this basin was much deeper. And in contrast, the Central Mirroca Depression is found at intermediate depth, but has the thickest average halide thickness. And this is the only one of the basins where there is a topographic sill separating it from the rest of the Mediterranean at a significant elevation compared to uh, the depth of the depot center. So what these, the presence of these basins indicates is that the onset of halide deposition must have taken place at relatively high water levels in order to explain the presence of halide at 500 meters uh, as seen in the Cogedor Basin. But also uh, that raises a very interesting question as to why we don't have any halide preserved in the Valencia Basin, which was already deeper at the time of the halide deposition. So a possible model to explain these observations would be uh, one where we have initially halide deposition along the entire margins, also at shallow depth. And then during the drawdown stage in the open Valencia Basin and with a large freshwater supply, we will be able to dissolve or erode the halides, which would then be redeposited into the deep basin. While on the Balearic Promontory, we have halide patches that are both protected from erosion by their topographic sills, and also here we have a, a smaller freshwater supply. So possibly this would be more protected from dissolution. And this could then explain why we would preserve the halides here on uh, higher elevations, even though they would have been subaerial exposed during the drawdown. So the Central Mirroca Depression in specific actually provides a very interesting um, input for uh, trying to constrain the salinity conditions during the uh, evaporite deposition. And this was done using a completely different modeling approach. And this work was led by Ronja Ebner and Fado Rath, two uh, salt giants collaborators, where we treat the Central Mallorca Depression as a kind of, uh, we, we restore the topography and we look at the volume of the basin and we see, we treat it as having either no connection to the Mediterranean, so all the salt and water would be preserved here, or a one-way connection where salt and water are flowing in, or a two-way exchange, and what we can look at are the possible velocities of salinification, the contrast between the same day and the Mediterranean, and the, the rate at which the uh, evaporites would have been deposited. And the most interesting result of this that I would like to share with you today is related to the halide volumes in the Central America Depression and the large Western Mediterranean Basin when we treat them as isolated basins. So here is an example from the Central America Depression where we look at the water volume contained at a certain depth by the basin. So as the water level goes down, the volume contained by the basin reduces. And then when we dissolve the observed volume of halide that we have in this basin in the corresponding volume for each depth, we get a brine that has a certain uh, salinity that is more saline if you have a smaller volume as you, you are dissolving the same amount of salt in a smaller water volume. So when we look at the halide concentration corresponding to each water volume, and the place where it intersects the halide saturation point, this gives us the minimum volume or a water depth that must have been needed in the Central America Depression to contain all of the halide that we observe. And what we see is that this point actually intersects more or less with the restored depth of the topographic sill with the deep basin. So what this tells us is that it is potentially possible to form all of the halides that we see in the Central America Depression if the halide deposition started only once the basin was disconnected from the rest of the Western Mediterranean. But in contrast, when we look at the deep Mediterranean basin or the deep Western basin, 
Here we see the percentage of halides that would have been formed when we start the drawdown at different initial salinities. So when we start already at halide saturation, that means that you start to produce halides the moment that the water level starts to drop, it's possible to form the entire Western Mediterranean halides just with a drawdown of 1600 meters, which is quite a nice fit with our shoreline restoration, considering the uncertainties in both of these approaches. But when you start the uh, deposition at a, at a lower water level, so that means a lower initial salinity, for example, here informed by, by the results in the same day, we start the halide deposition only once the Central America depression gets disconnected. And what we see is that it's still possible to form the entire Western Mediterranean halide volume, but this would require a complete desiccation of the basin. And this is uh, not in line with general ideas of how a isolated basin would behave if you still have a certain freshwater uh, inflow. So this suggests both of these results actually confirm that it's possible to form all of the halides in the Western Mediterranean only during the drawdown stage. And it's not necessary to reach saturation before the onset of the uh, drawdown. So now we'll take a look at the final results in the Nile Delta. And this work has been published very recently by, uh, led by Zohar Gritzman at the Geological Survey of Israel. And this is based on the Nile Canyon incision, actually, that I already talked about during the introduction of this presentation where recently there has been uh, quite a, a more scrutiny on the results of the um, final assemblages that are found at the Asman Dam. And uh, this idea, actually the fauna that is found is possibly non-marine and uh, the age is also not very well constrained. So this has put a big question mark on this major incision of the Nile Canyon during the Mycenaean. So what we do here is we start from a new structural map of the base Pliocene surface which is based on uh, seismic interpretations and supported by wells along the uh, Messinian Canyon in the Nile. And um, what we do is restore the topography again for the flexural response to the deposition of a very major volume of post Messinian uh, sediments in the Nile Delta and also decompacting the underlying sediments. What we see is quite a particular profile for the Nile Canyon in this region where um, we, it is indeed, here we have the observed uh, base. So this is the modern depth of this canyon. And this is at around 1500 meters or close to 1500 meters around Cairo. But when you go south a few kilometers, the depth of this canyon abruptly decreases. And it seems that upstream, we have the normal pre messinian uh, flats uh, uh, river profile. While when you go downstream from this 400 meter high uh, feature, we see that for about 50 kilometers, the uh, the river canyon is relatively flat and then abruptly it changes into a more steep profile. So when we restore or this a transition from a flat to a steep profile is interpreted as a potential shoreline marker, as this is also observed in uh, modern rivers. And what we do is we restore the depth of that potential paleo shoreline marker, uh, accounting for the flexure and the decompaction. And then we lower the water level to match and uh, the matching water level is the best fit at around 600 meters drawdown. And this is very interesting as it is still much larger than you would expect from climate variations. But this drawdown is several times smaller than estimates from the, uh, sorry, it's, it's larger than climate variations, but it's much smaller than previous estimates from the Eastern Mediterranean. And also if indeed we have a 50 kilometer retrogressive erosion during this low stand stage, and this represents the large waterfall uh, formed during the uh, Messinian, then even though we are not really able to exactly know how much time must have passed in order to form this feature, we can suggest that possibly it's a slightly longer lived stable water level that is recorded as the shoreline marker. So then we have all the results from around the Mediterranean and we want to take a look how they fit uh, between the different basins and if we get a more consistent image uh, here in this uh, plot that we saw also at the beginning. And actually we are, what we could already tell is that the water levels that we restore are still very, very variable. And it doesn't seem like uh, we can fit a single water level to the low stand stage for the Mediterranean. And in addition, when we compare our results to previous models for uh, the relation of the drawdown and the evaporate deposition, we can broadly categorize them as three different models where we either have almost no drawdown and the deposition of halides in a deep brine layer, other scenarios where we have a large drawdown before the halide deposition and the deposition of plastics in the deep basin, where the halide would then be formed in low water level, 
or a third scenario where we uh, have a high water level concentrated brine and then during the water level drop we form the entire halide volume. So in our results we see that erosion is found at depths well over one kilometer and so this does not fit very well with the first uh, class of model and because we find halides preserved in relatively shallow basins uh, on the Balearic promontory this says or informs us that deposition probably must have started at a relatively early stage of the drawdown. So the second scenario also does not fit very well with our results. And because we show that actually we can form all of the halite in the Western Mediterranean, at least during a drawdown stage, the third category of model is the one that um, I think is preferred based on uh, the results I show here. And from both of the results of my thesis, but also other people's work and uh, wide discussions within uh, our project. Actually, we can go a little bit further and ID or uh, imagine a model for the general progression of the Mycidian salinity crisis, starting at the onset of the drawdown. So during stage two, we see that we have a uh, erosion up to 1500 meters in the Western Mediterranean and the preservation of halite that was formed during a drawdown of about that magnitude, possibly. And then the basin in the Western Mediterranean would have been disconnected from the east at the Sicily Sill. And in the east, we don't really have a solid constraint on the initial magnitude of drawdown um, because uh, we, we are not able to exclude that the water level went down much further than 600 meters uh, at some point during the Mycenaean. But possibly it might be related to the restoration of shore platforms on the Malta escarpment. Um, and then when we go to stage three, we have a much longer period of time. So much more climate variability and variability in the freshwater inflow. And what we see during, possibly during stage three, is that we record much more variable water levels in the uh, Western Mediterranean, where we record the different terrace depths in the Albadan Basin and the 1100 meter onlap of the upper unit. While in the Eastern Mediterranean, possibly we have a slightly longer lived stable base level at minus 600 meters. Although we don't know if the water level oscillated below this level also, um, because we have also the proposed deep uh, fluvial deposits there. But what this informs us, and also because we have our results in the Gibraltar arc, where it suggests that a drawdown would actually cause an uplift in the arc that would make it very difficult to supply Atlantic waters into the Mediterranean during the low stand stage. This suggests that to have bigger variability in the Western Mediterranean than the East, it makes more sense to imagine a water source coming from the Eastern part of the Mediterranean than from the West. So instead of Atlantic waters, perhaps the water level variability here would be caused by variations of the climate and also possibly a larger role for the Paratetis waters, which we also observe in the stage three deposits. And uh, this would help to explain maybe the low salinity signal of the Lago Mare basin. So I think this is something um, that is interesting to look into into the future because we have the impact of the Paratetis water on the Mediterranean water level budget, which really I think is a little bit misunderstood. Because in the modern day, we see that the Mediterranean catchments are relatively small and arid and that the water budget, so the evaporation minus precipitation value, is much bigger than zero. So it has a negative freshwater budget. But the Paratetis basins, which now cover the Black Sea and the Caspian catchments, actually the Black Sea we know nowadays has a, a, fre or a positive freshwater budget and the Caspian has a quite a large surface area lake being supported by the rivers flowing in there. So we can imagine that if we have important changes in the drainage configuration, where possibly a larger amount of the Paratetis catchment was being supplied into the Mediterranean, in addition with the climate variability on a precession cycle, we might be able to cause quite large variations in the Mediterranean equilibrium water level. Now the equilibrium water level is just when you reduce the surface area in order to reduce the amount of evaporation happening over a basin in order to bring it back into balance with the freshwater budget. So a small surface area, a low equilibrium water level would uh, go with a very large freshwater deficit. Well, if you have uh, more freshwater coming in, the equilibrium level would rise. And here we do just a very, very preliminary um, investigation of the possible impacts of uh, climate variation and the impact of the paratetis on the equilibrium level here on the y-axis in both the Western Mediterranean basins restored and the Eastern Mediterranean, where we don't have a complete restored hypsometry, but we use the modern one. And what we see is that when we vary the evaporation precipitation uh, values around modern uh, expected values, this can already provoke variations in the equilibrium level on the scale of 100, hundreds of meters, both in the Western Mediterranean and in the Eastern Mediterranean. 
And then when we add a major river, possibly uh, from the Paratetis, in this case, just as a um, thought experiment, we add the modern runoff of the Volga River into the Eastern Mediterranean. And we see that this might potentially rise the equilibrium level of the Eastern Mediterranean by up to 1000 meters and can push it into a positive freshwater budget, possibly supplying water into the Western Mediterranean. Um, so this really illustrates the importance of the geometry of basins when we look at the impact of freshwater budgets. So even though the Paratetis might not have had a huge volume, its surface area suggests that it possibly, if more water from the Paratetis was coming into the Mediterranean while it was isolated from the Atlantic, the water level might have been quite variable. So uh, just very briefly, the conclusions of the work in my thesis, we see that the bathymetry in the Western Mediterranean was quite similar to the modern day and that the original depth of formation for the erosional markers uh, was quite a bit shallower than where they are observed today in the seismic stratigraphy, depending on the sediment cover and the tectonic setting. And that our paleo shoreline markers were formed at a very variable depth, reaching up to 1500 meters in the Western Mediterranean and around 600 meters in the east based on our Nile Canyon erosion. And in addition, we identified that the most likely location for the topographic barrier between the Atlantic and Mediterranean was at the Gibraltar arc, and that this arc would have responded by isostatic rebound if the water level dropped, and that this would further isolate the Mediterranean from the Atlantic. And this suggests that if we have sea level changes during the low stand stage, they might be controlled more by the freshwater budget and not Atlantic inflow. And also that based on our reconstructed hypsometry and our halite thickness combination in the Western Mediterranean, we see that it is possible to form the entire halite volume during a drawdown where the salinity of the basin was not above, um, was not at uh, saturation for halite before the drawdown started, but rather would start it around the saturation point. So a few open questions uh, that I think are very interesting for future work, mostly based on numerical modeling approaches. Um, the first one is, can we explain better why we preserve halite where we find it, for example, on the Balearic promontory, but not in other basins such as the Valencia and Alberan basin? So was halite indeed deposited everywhere originally and then uh, bonded, or is there some other process that can explain its distribution? And I think that the restorative symmetry that we have provides a good starting point for numerical modeling of the surface evolution through erosion or dissolution uh, on these basins. A second thing that I think is very, very important is to get a better constraint on the depth of the Sicily sail during the Mycenaean crisis as this is a very important controlling uh, effect on the water exchange between the eastern and the western Mediterranean basins, both during the desiccation stage and also during the reflooding. And because we don't know exactly what this depth was, it's difficult to really link, for example, paleo shoreline markers or equilibrium water levels to uh, this important connection. And also, I think something that would be very interesting is to uh, do numerical modeling on the evolution of the brines that would have been preserved in the basin during an isolation from the Atlantic. So what happens to a brine that is quite saturated when you have repeated stages of dilution and concentration? And would this be recorded in, for example, the upper evaporites that we uh, might want to sample? And of course, uh, as many people have already no mentioned before, and what fortunately seems to be now going forward, we need more sampling directly of the Mediterranean uh, to find the real, the, the composition and the structure of the uh, Mycenaean deposits, and also what was going on, for example, before the evaporite deposition. And hopefully soon we will have the image campaign to already inform us a little bit better on the evolution of the gateway regions. But for me, something that is actually the most interesting would be to know what is underneath the uh, evaporites in the deep Western Mediterranean basin. So um, I would like to thank everybody that has made this work possible. Of course, my supervisors and also everybody in the Salt Giant project. And um, thank you very much. And I would love to discuss the results further. <laughs>